first, what I'm going to be doing is presenting the FDA 101 section, which will be a broad top, an over, a broad overview of topics that may be important to, to patient advocates. Okay, so this is what our campus looks like, an aerial view. I think that most of the FDA offices are now located at the White Oak campus in Silver Spring, Maryland. And this is the FDA's mission and regulatory philosophy. There's two parts. The first is protecting public health by assuring the safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs, biologic products, and medical devices and advancing the public health by helping to speed innovations that make medicines and foods more effective, safer, and more affordable, and helping the public to get the accurate science-based information they need to use medicines and foods to improve their health. This slide and the next slide shows all the significant dates, or some of, most of the significant dates in the history of the food and drug law history. Um, it's important to note that major lawmaking activities have focused on FDA repeatedly over the past century as a result of public health disasters. And I think you can see the last major change was in 2009 when uh, tobacco products, the oversight of tobacco products was added to FDA's regulatory authority. Everything that FDA does is dictated by law and can be found in the code of regulations code of federal regulation. Okay, so within FDA, there are three main centers. The first one is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, and it's also known as CEDAR. CEDAR regulates the over-the-counter and prescription drugs, including biological therapeutics and generic drugs. This work covers more than just medicines. For example, fluoride toothpaste, antiperspirants, dandruff shampoos, and sunscreens are all considered drugs. The next center is for biologics, and it's called the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, also known as CEBR. CEBR regulates biological and related products, including blood, vaccines, allergenic tissue, and cellular and gene therapy. Biologics are derived from living sources, such as humans, um, animals, and microorganisms. And they're not easily identified, and they're often manufactured using biotechnology. The last center, we won't discuss very much, um, but I will raise it periodically throughout my presentation to tell you a little bit about devices, but we're not experts in that area. So it's, it's pretty different from the biologic and the drug evaluation process. And that is the Devices in Radiological Health, CDRH. And CDRH reg regulates a broad range of medical devices including um, complicated high-risk medical devices like artificial hearts and relatively simple low-risk devices such as uh, tongue depressors and then anything that falls in between such as sutures. These are some of the other offices that are located within FDA, including the office that Selena and I work at, out of the Office of Health and Constituent Affairs, and our office works with external stakeholders such as yourself and internal stakeholders such as the centers that I just talked about. Um, many of these offices that are listed on this page and others that I didn't include are there to support the three review divisions. What I'm going to do now is I, I, I want to make something clear. When I speak of a sponsor, I'm speak, most of the time, I'm speaking in terms of a drug manufacturer, such as a pharmaceutical firm. And when I mention investigators, these are the clinicians who actually conducted clinical trials. And I'll remind you of that again later on in the presentation. So basically, what happens is a company, the sponsor, will come into FDA, will submit an application. Uh, for biologics and drugs, it's called an investigational new drug application, and for devices, it's an investigational device exemption application. And by regulation, the IND is the process under which human trials of investigational drugs are conducted. They cannot be conducted until FDA has approved the IND. And drugs and biologics often follow the same regulations, and investigational biologic um, large molecules, uh, biologics which are large molecules are often called um, 
they go by investigational use drug application the same term because as I said, the biologics are large molecules. The drugs themselves are smaller molecules, but they're all drugs essentially. And then like I said, for devices, there's the IDE. The ID the INDs, the IDEs applications are reviewed by FDA before any clinical trials can begin. I think that this is important for for patient advocates to understand the types of meetings that take place between sponsors. Again, that's the drug company and FDA. There's a type A meeting. These are important meetings. This means that there's an issue that is actually going to stall drug development if they don't uh, remedy the, the situation. And so FDA usually responds within 30 days and sets up a meeting. The type B meetings are probably most interesting to patient advocates because these are the, the pre-IND meetings, the end of phase one meetings, et cetera, as you can see on the slide. And the idea of this is to look at the data that was uh, obtained from the clinical trial, the prior clinical trial, and to see if there's any changes that need to take place in the trial design endpoint, see if there's uh, need to have a discussion about recruitment of patients, if that's an issue. Um, these occur within 60 days. The type C meeting is just any type of meeting that the sponsor needs to hold with FDA that is not a type A or a type C. Okay, so we've gone through the INDs and the IDEs, and we've gone through the clinical trials. So now the company, the sponsor, has finished the clinical trials, and what they do is they pull the data together, and they analyze the data, and then the sponsor submits the application for approval of the drug. That would be an NDA or a BLA. Now, the, um, that is for the drug. For the devices, as I said, I would touch on it a little bit. There are two types of device submissions. There's the pre-market approval and the pre-market notification 510K. And basically, the pre-market approval is determined, if the, if the new device is determined not to be substantially equivalent to an approved device, then it must go through clinical trials to get approval. If it's a pre-market notification, in the pre-market notification, if the new device is determined by FDA to be substantially equivalent, and that is there's a predicate, then an approval of the device, uh, and yeah, it, if it's equivalent to an approved device, FDA will provide clearance for the device to go to the market, and there will not be any clinical trials that will be necessary. So now the applications have come in, and what happens is it goes to the, the center where it's appropriate, whether it's a drug or biologic, and then once in the center, it goes to the a review team that have expertise in this area. And what they are doing, each member of the review team is reviewing the application based on their expertise. And again, they're looking at safety and efficacy as well as the proposed use and if the benefits of the drug outweigh the risk. Um, and how appropriate the labeling is, et cetera. I'm, I'm going to talk really briefly about each of the members of the team, the review team. The first one's the project member, and the pro there are two primary roles for the project member, and that is to facilitate the review process and to be the primary contact for the sponsor. Every team has at least one medical officer, and they review all the clinical studies, and again, they're looking at um, safety and efficacy, they're looking at the protocol design, endpoints, they are also looking at the clinical investigators who supply the, the clinical data to, to make sure that they followed all the procedures properly. Um, so they're going to be looking at anything that's clinically related. Now you have the pharmacology and toxicology specialist, and this team reviews all the non-clinical meaning the animal studies, which take place prior to the, uh, the IND application. Um, the animal studies are um, usually done on two species because the, a drug may affect one differently than another. 
And what the pharmacologist is doing is he's looking at the data to determine uh, whether it's pharmacological action and toxic effects of the drug uh, as it's related to its use, what they are, as well as looking at the reproductive and fetal effects. Um, and again, these studies are done prior to the IMD. And the statistician, uh, what happens is the sponsor will submit the application with raw data from the investigators, and then they will run, the sponsor will run the analyses. They will send that data to FDA. The FDA statisticians will review the analysis completed by the sponsor. They will rerun those analyses, and sometimes they will also conduct additional analyses. And the next slide should show clinical pharmacology and biopharmaceutics. And what these uh, reviewers are doing is looking at the molecular level data. They're looking at the uh, background ABME studies, and that's the, the adsorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, the bioavailability and bioequivalent studies, et cetera. And the next slide are the chemist and the biologist and microbiologist. And these reviewers evaluate the drug substance product in the areas of components and composition, manufacturing, controls, batch formulation. They want to make sure that uh, all the controls were in place, that the batches are produced um, up to the qualities they're supposed to be at, and it's all consistent across batches, et cetera. So now what I did was I reviewed the the INDs, then we went through the clinical trials, and we went through the application process. So now the application process is with FDA. They're going through, the review team is going through the application. Sometimes what happens is there's a complex scientific, technical, or policy issue that FDA wants some expert opinions on, and they will pull together an advisory committee. Uh, meeting. They'll pull together a panel for a meeting. And for example, um, an advisory committee may be needed for providing FDA advice about whether or not the, the, to, you know, how to weigh the risks and benefits of a new potential treatment for a disease. Now, an NDA or a BAL for something um, in the area of myotonic dystrophy uh, that requires an advisory com committee meeting would might come before the Peripheral Central Nervous System Drugs Advisory Committee. Um, so now, this is the Peripheral and Central Nervous System Drugs Advisory Committee, and the purpose is to, again, to, to look at the data, to review and evaluate the data concerning safety and efficacy. And the committee is basically made up of a core of nine voting members, and that includes the chair. and the members are chosen either by the commissioner or a designee among authorities who are knowledgeable in the fields of neurology, neuro neuropharmacology, neuro neuropathology, otolaryngology, epidemiology, statistics, and related specialties. And the big thing to remember about this is that the panel puts forth recommendations to the commissioner but these are strictly recommendations. They are non-binding. Also, the other important thing to, to note is that most advisory committee panels do include a patient rep, and I believe Celine is going to be talking more about that in her presentation. Now we're on to the approval process. A standard review takes 10 months, and a standard review starts after FDA has received the NDA or VLA application and decided that the application is fileable, meaning that it's complete. All sections must be received by FDA before the clock starts, before they will start to review the application. Um, it, you will see here the FDA will approve an application after it determines that the drug meets the statutory standards for safety and effectiveness, manufacturing controls and labeling, um, FDA is required to exercise scientific judgment for, to make these determinations. And FDA views on 
makes its views on drug products and classes of drugs available through guidance documents, recommendations, and other policy statements. And these can be found on the FDA website. Now, besides the regular approval, FDA does have several mechanisms to speed access to promising drugs to treat to treat serious diseases and to fill unmet needs. So the next slide lists the four types of mechanisms for accelerate approval, priority review, fast track designation, and breakthrough therapies designation. Speeding the availability of drugs that treat serious diseases and uh, unmet needs are in everyone's interest, especially when the drugs are the first available treatment or the drug has an advantage over the standard treatments, the existing treatments. To date, there are these four mechanisms. Um, sponsors need to apply for the mechanisms, and they can apply to more than just one. They can apply to one, two, three. They can apply to all four. The accelerated approval process. The, the accelerated approval allows for earlier approvals of drugs to treat serious diseases and that fill an unmet medical need based on a surrogate endpoint. So that's one of the prime issues with um, the accelerated approval. It's going to be based on a surrogate endpoint. And a surrogate endpoint is a marker, and that is a laboratory measurement or a physical sign that is used in clinical trials as an indirect or substitute measure measurement that represents a clinically meaningful outcome, such as survival or symptom improvement. By going through this mechanism of accelerated approval it, and using an endpoint instead, a surrogate endpoint instead of a, a longer term endpoint, such as overall survival, you really shorten the amount of time that's required prior to receiving FDA approval. The other thing to note about accelerated approval is that it's, a, it's only approved on a condition, and that is that post-marketing clinical trials, known as phase four clinical trials, must verify the clinical benefit. So if, if there's a clinical benefit at, that the phase four trial, the confirmatory trials show, the FDA will grant traditional approval. If there's no clinical benefit, FDA has the regulatory procedures in place to remove the drug from the market or from the uh, indication on the label. Sometimes these drugs may have three or four indications, and maybe two or three of them are the regular approval, and one may be the accelerated approval. The clinical trials with the, the not clinical trials, but the confirmatory trials would be on the accelerated approval and it would have to prove clinical benefit. It doesn't mean that if it doesn't, that the drug will come off the market. It, that's why I said either the drug will be removed from the market or in the case where there's more than one indication, then just that indication would come off the label. The next slide is priority review and this is really for uh, diseases where there's, the treatment is inadequate or just doesn't exist. And so instead of a 10-month review, you got it down to a six-month review. It's designated, again, to uh, facilitate the development and expedite the review of drugs for serious diseases and fill an unmet medical need. And the, the big thing with Fast Track, what makes it go faster is that they allow a, what's called a rolling review with the regular approval. As you may remember, I said that the FDA cannot start the review until they've received all parts of the application. They have to have the whole application in front of them. Here with Fast Track, as they get completed sections uh, from the, of the MDA, FDA will start reviewing those completed sections. And the next slide is breakthrough therapies. And again, it's for serious or life-threatening disease. And what happens here is that if the sponsor notices that the drug is demonstrating a substantial improvement over existing therapies or one more clinical significant endpoint, and that this is seen early in 
the drug um, development process, they can apply for a breakthrough therapy that would help get this drug onto the market faster. So Nathaleen is going to talk about patient advocacy at FDA. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Deb. That was a great overview. Um, I think it's really helpful to have a basic understanding of the agency, especially when we're talking about the next topic, which is uh, really focused on patient engagement. And as Deb mentioned, uh, we work with an offices of FDA's Office of Health and Constituent Affairs, which we call by its acronym OCA. And today, I plan to answer the question that many patients and patient advocates come to visit us with. Um, how can we get connected to the agency? When I got here a little over two years ago, I learned quickly that this agency speaks a distinct language, and sometimes it's not easily digestible. Uh, what I also learned was that if I want to help translate that language, I was in the right office. Um, you, the patients, the caregivers, are in fact our office's primary stakeholder. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that once you learn how to speak FDA, your voice gets louder, for sure. To help understand where we fall in the agency, um, I wanted to look at the organization chart. Um, OCA is located within the Office of External Affairs, and that's within the Office of the Commissioner. And our primary job is really to connect with and form relationships with various key stakeholders and communities. Okay, the office is comprised of two teams. We have the health professional team on one end and the patient liaison team on the other. And although we are two distinct uh, teams, we often work together. Uh, the health professional team really works hard to make connections with the health professionals and health professional organizations. Now, the patient team's primary stakeholder, of course, is you, the patient or the advocate and caregiver. And I can't tell you how many calls we get from patients who just want to share their experiences or just want any help for their loved one or even get more information on drugs that they happen to learn about on the news. Um, so on a daily basis, we field a lot of types of patient inquiries, and I can say with certainty that each of these calls is such a unique opportunity for us to make an impression on the caller. Um, and the way I can describe this office, if I had to sum it up in three phrases, is, is that we really listen, because sometimes we get calls where someone is just so frustrated that they, all they want to do is be heard. And that's exactly what we do. We listen. Uh, we educate. Many patients and patient groups need a better understanding of what we do, so we often have to serve as quote-unquote translators describing how the agency works and how the drug development process works in simple terms. And as a result, uh, people become more familiar and engaged with the agency's activities, and they start asking the right questions. So education is a really big component of what we do. And lastly, I think a big part of what we do is advocate. Um, as Ed mentioned, the reviewers within each center and division are so focused on their processes that there's often a disconnect between them and the outside world. So one way that our office has been described to as a is a bridge that links the FDA reviewers with the patient community. And I like that model. But another way that I think of our office is, is a string. Um, so to explain, uh, we would be the string that connects you and the center's reviewers by providing information which would be the sound that travels through the string, um, using various communication vehicles, and um, that would be the vibrations on the string. And initially, I thought maybe it would be interesting to use probably two iPhones just to make more current, but I didn't think the 3G network was visually uh, compelling, so I left it at this. But I think you guys get the gist. Okay, so how does our office bring you to the medical product development process? There are so many ways. First off, there's the FDA patient for patients webpage. About three years ago, our office worked very hard to get a patient presence on the FDA website, uh, which historically has been viewed as an industry-centric entity, but really we've been engaging with patients for a really long time. Our website, however, needed to be able to showcase that. So as a result, what exists today is a for patients resource page that's strictly devoted to patients and patient advocates and really serves as a, as a one-stop shop to learn as much as possible about the regulatory process. The URL to this page is at the bottom of the slide, um, and the bottom of the next slide as well. Too. So on this page, you can get all sorts of information. You can get information about upcoming agency-sponsored uh, meetings, public meetings, um, watch recorded webinars with FDA experts. Uh, you can subscribe to our bi-weekly patient network newsletter, which I highly recommend. It is an excellent resource for getting announcements in a timely way. You can also access clinicaltrials.gov to learn about clinical trial processes and find trials that may be right for you. 
um, in the event that you or a loved one doesn't respond to current approved therapy for various reasons, you can learn about treatment options. Um, so the site really does a good job of explaining the drug and device approval process. So it's really a site that you want to check out. Um, okay, so during the year, our office hosts many meetings with patients and their communities and sometimes connects them with a review division so they have some face-to-face -face time with the FDA experts. Uh, these meetings are extremely valuable to us because they're unique opportunities for us to really hear from the patients firsthand. Uh, it's a time to share concerns and provide clarity to us, on, to us on any misconceptions about a condition. It's also time for our experts to relay information that would help better understand the internal processes. And as I mentioned earlier, we continuously field calls from patients on all sorts of issues. It's really a big part of what we do in the office. Um, so I'm putting a plug that if you have any questions for us, I listed our email address at the bottom and um, I can tell you to please email us. Now I want to touch on some other ways that um, are really effective to connect with FDA. Um, so as you know, FDA is a regulatory agency. We publish using the Federal Register rules and guidances that establish or modify the way we do business. In them, we often ask for comments. So clearly decisions are not made by chance in a vacuum. They are formed with public input. Uh, for example, last year in November, we issued an FR notice, um, which we call short for Red Federal Register Notice, FR notice, that asked the question, what more can the agency do to obtain the views of patients during the medical product development process? And how can we further consider patients' perspectives during regulatory decisions? As a result, we received many comments from organizations and individual patients, and we're vetting those right now as we speak. If you need more information, the For Patients website on FDA.gov is a great resource, and you can get more information about that as well. Okay, so another very effective and direct way to show your thoughts and opinions um, is through meetings. Uh, for example, the advisory committee meetings that Deb mentioned, there's a devoted time on the schedule for us to listen to views and opinions from the public, from patients. Um, as she also mentioned, you have the sponsor in the room, the FDA staff, we have scientists, statisticians, and others who are there who are available to hear what you have to say. So it's a unique um, opportunity. Um, the FDA also holds periodically meetings to gather input from various stakeholders, including patients, and these are what we call Part 15 public hearings. Um, they're opportunities for broader public participation and comment on various topics. All right, the patient-focused drug development meetings are yet another way for the patient voice to be heard. The agency began these meetings in 2013 um, to really get a systematic approach on obtaining the patient perspective on certain diseases and treatments. How did it get nominated? Um, well, there's a public process to solicit uh, nominations, and I believe last year there was a uh, Federal Register notice that was published uh, seeking nominations for 2016 and 2017. I believe that is the end of the five-year um, nomination process for submitting comments or sub for nominating topics. Um, the outcome of these meetings is an agency report. It's called the Voice of the Patient, and it's really a detailed summary of each of the meetings. And it documents, in the patient's own words, what matters to them most in terms of the impact of disease and treatment approaches. So it really is a piece that informs the agency. As you can see, the next meeting is scheduled for April 2nd and is on breast cancer. And again, you can learn more about this on the four patients website that was listed. Okay, now the real focus of my presentation, um, FDA's Patient Representative Program. This program is managed by our office, uh, our office of patient liaison team, and really is such an exciting part of what we do. It brings the patient voice directly to the table, and I mean literally to the table. Um, here's a group picture of uh, the patient representatives from last year from our workshop. All right, so in order to help you better understand where the intersections lie between the patient reps and the development process, I think this graphic is pretty useful. Um, the two bottom, uh, there's two squares at the bottom of the slide, um, and one square, the one on the left, um, indicates that the patient reps can serve as consultants. I refer to these as divisional assignments because it, it brings the, um, the patient into discussions early on in the process and uh, connects them directly with the drug sponsor uh, and the FDA reviewers in a closed meeting. And this is typically done in a as a conference call. Um, but more commonly, we use the patient reps 
as panel members on the advisory committee meetings, and that's the square on the right, and that's typically um, during the final phases of these. Okay, so these patient reps are temporary voting members on a panel, and there's usually only one patient rep per meeting, although that hasn't always been the case. Um, they're generally open to the public, unlike divisional assignments. Uh, patient reps have a critical role, and that is to share with the agency their own experiences and those of their community so that we can make the final decision on whether to approve a product or to change a product or to completely pull it off the market. So along with other specialties in the panel, like the physicians and scientists that I mentioned, uh, the patient reps really bring a unique perspective to the table. Um, Incorporating patient reps into the process is an extremely valuable part of what we do, and our office is responsible for making sure the right patient, patient rep is assigned to each meeting. And last year alone, we helped identify and assign patient reps for about close to 60 advisory committee meetings. Okay, now just to touch on the divisional assignments briefly, uh, FDA review staff can call on a patient rep at any point earlier in the process to get their perspectives, and uh, this is an extremely important part of the process as well because it's another opportunity to engage with the patient and incorporate their input before a final decision is made. Um, now, I should mention that um, Section 1137 of FDA's Safety and Innovation Act, known as FDASIA, um, which recognized the value of patient input in the entire drug development process, was signed into law in 2012. However, the agency has been including patients in their processes for years. And I just want to um, take a, a, a detour and talk about the timeline. So these are some of the historical milestones of how we've involved patients in the past. Uh, the initial milestone was back in 1988 when the FDA formed our office, which was originally established to work with patient advocates focusing mostly on HIV and AIDS community. Um, and as a result, in, in 91, the first patient rep was called to serve on the um, antiviral drug advisory committee for HIV. In 1994, cancer patient advocates were recruited into the patient rep program, which then expanded um, to include patients and caregivers of serious and life-threatening diseases. And in 96, uh, patient reps received voting privileges as members of the advisory committee. Um, the role of patient reps expands to serve as consultants for divisional assignments in 2001, and about 10 years later, the agency created the patient network, which I refer to as the four patients website. But it still can be referred to as a patient network. Um, a year after that, as I mentioned, FDASIA Section 1137 came into effect, after which a working group was started to develop the procedures for implementing 1137 across the agency. And finally, in November of last year, we issued a Federal Register notice as part of 1137 to capture patient advocacy group perspectives on suggestions for how FDA can increase and improve patient participation earlier in the process. And I think I mentioned that earlier as well. Okay, so back to the patient rep program. How, uh, oh, how do we pick the patient reps? How do we select them? How do we identify them? There is a recipe. Um, we want an effective patient rep, and, and one of the things we really look for is, is the, the patient ha or patient rep has to have personal experience with the disease or condition. That could be either as a patient or as a primary caregiver. And ideally, we do like to see actual patients on board, but we understand this can always be possible. Um, say, for example, if it's a pediatric condition or if it's a condition that's so debilitating that the caregiver really is only the best option for relaying experiences. The patient, the patient community awareness is also an important part of being a patient rep. We really want someone who's active in their respective organizations and really understands the issues that their communities are facing. Um, we also would like someone who's analytical and, and objective, who doesn't necessarily need to be a scientist, but could be able to understand basic scientific principles and, is and issues. Uh, because some of the information that is presented is, is complex, and decisions do have to be made using that information. Um, so right now, we currently have about 190 patient reps, and they're savvy, they're smart, influential in their communities, and because of this, there runs a risk of conflicts of interest which we as an agency pay very close attention to. So bringing the rep on board who's minimally conflicted is what we aim for. Um, and last but not least, we want someone who's got great communication skills. Uh, this is so important in serving, especially when you're in a large room full of experts, it can be a little bit intimidating. So here's a list of some of the conditions of which we have about 120, um, 120 conditions um, on right now represented. Uh, represented by the 190 patient reps. And uh, we often have multiple, multiple folks on the condition, which is why that number is off. 
um, conditions include AIDS, HIV, cystic fibrosis, Parkinson's, and muscular dystrophy. Um, and obviously, I wish we could say that we have representation for every medical condition. However, we do not. And the reason for this is not because we don't have a manpower or any other reason. It's simply because we recruit based on need. If a medical product is not coming up for review, nor will be discussed at a meeting, there really isn't a need, in, need to recruit at this point. Um, however, what we do is work really closely with the reviewers and the division to try to predict and get a better sense of what's to come ahead so that we can plan ahead and recruit the appropriate person earlier in the process. And of course, this takes time. But once you're on board, we begin the training. So this is how we train and keep the patient reps active and engaged while they wait to serve. Um, with each new patient rep, we make it a point to really emphasize the significance of the program and hold an individual FDA 101, which basically provides the overview, similar to what um, Deb had provided. Now, I mentioned earlier that serving can be intimidating for some. So we've learned that by having more seasoned reps uh, share their experiences, it's really helped those who are unsure of their role and new at serving, um, becoming more informed and in turn confident at, at serving. Um, as part of the sharing information, we go into detail what the room looks like, who the panel members are, who's in the meeting, um, who's going to be attending outside of that, and those are really key pieces that are valuable to them. Uh, our office offers regular webinars strictly for patient reps so that they can continually stay engaged because oftentimes during their four-year term, they don't always serve. So we do try to keep them ready to serve um, by consistently feeding them information. And of course, I've talked at length about the four patient site, which we created to be a resource for patients, and that includes the patient reps. Finally, each year, uh, about the middle or end of summer, our office holds the um, annual patient rep workshop, which is strictly for patient reps. Um, there, and it only really includes the patient reps who have just been brought over the last year. It's really a, a great one and a half day excellent um, um, immersion course, really, that's um, highly interactive. Uh, it's a closed meeting so they can ask whatever questions they want, and we feel comfortable sharing information as well. Okay, so what is the value provided to FDA? Um, what is what is important? Why is it important to engage patients in the regulatory process? I mean, why do we why do we do this at all? And there are many reasons. Um, it's because the patient point of view is simply mandatory. The issues and concern, the issues that concern you, the one, you're the ones living with the condition. Um, this is one that is critical and is needed to shape the outcome of our decisions. Secondly, it brings the human element into the picture. After all, the patients are the end users. Uh, patients bring diversity of opinion, viewpoint, and experience. Um, engaging patients makes them feel as though they have the best of interest in the process. Um, patients bring opportunities to increase quality of life, such as reporting adverse events once the product is already out. So in the end, our office is committed to really creating a patient and patient advocate community of ambassadors and educators so that you can continue to share what you've learned with others. So with that in mind, uh, Deb and I will take some questions if we have time. We do have a few questions um, from our participants. The first question is kind of what's an average amount of time that it takes to get a drug approved? I think that the, the average time is about 10 to 15 years, and that's all the research that, that includes all the research that's done in the laboratory before it even gets to humans, before it even gets to animals. So it, it does, it is a timely, or not timely, but a very time consuming process. With the caveat that you have those other accelerated ways of getting yeah, approved. Those, those accelerated ways are after it's been through the initial right. development, through the animal studies, and you're into the clinical trials and you see that the drug is for a very serious disease and there's a, a, a need to fill an unmet need. Mm -hmm. And that's when those four mechanisms would come into play. So but usually we say about 10, 10 to 15 years. Um, so what is more important to the FDA, safety or evidence that the drug works? They're equally important. And we follow them through the clinical trials, safety and effic efficacy. We follow them 
in post-market uh, studies, the confirmatory trials, we follow them once they're on the market. We, we keep track on the effectiveness and safety of these drugs through the MedWatch system, which we didn't talk about because we just had so much to discuss mm -hmm. today. So they're equally important. Is it faster to get drugs approved in the U.S. or in Europe? The last piece of data that I saw was just looking at oncology drugs, and it was put out by the Friends of Cancer Research, the study that they did. And actually, the drugs are getting approved faster in the U.S. right now. But, and I see that this is a question further down um, about working with the EMA and others. The FDA works very closely with the EMA. They work closely with Health, Health Canada and Japan. In fact, I know in oncology they have uh, monthly meetings where they discuss what applications are coming up, et cetera. Um, so that, because now a lot of the data, the clinical trials are being held glo in global locations, and so that data is being used by all of us, you know, EMA, FDA, Health Canada, et cetera, to approve clinical trials. So we really do keep in touch with what's happening. Um, and any kind of decisions that are made. And just to add to that, um, most recently we did have an EMA fellow come visit. Um, one of the things we're really focused on right now is to learn from each other's processes, especially on how they're engaging patients in their processes, which um, I think they're just really starting to take notice. And they've learned a lot coming here within that two weeks. It was quite an intense two weeks. Um, that fellow did develop a voice blog and it's on our website if you wanted to read more about her experience here. And I think that would be really helpful for you to understand, you know, some of the lessons learned. A couple years before Selena got here, we had a, a group from Japan who came in with oh. translators. <laughs> and we talked to them about what we do, and they talked to us about what they do over in Japan. And kind of continuing on that, does does approval from the EMA, European Medical Association, or you know Japanese Medical Association, or any other foreign bodies, does approval over there make gaining approval in the U.S. from the FDA um, any easier or harder, or does it affect it at all? Like I said, a lot of the same data is used to approve a drug here in the United States and in other countries. But the United States, to prove, you know, they, they have to still see the raw data. Mm -hmm. They have to see the evidence, just like the other countries. They insist on seeing all that data as well and doing their own analyses. Um, so I think that, uh, I'll take it. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that, you know, every country has to, make sure the drugs are safe and effective for their citizens. So, of course, they're going to take a look at the data intensely. We do talk to one another um, when a drug is being approved, often, you know, in the EMA, oftentimes USA will know about it, um, and they will have had discussions on why the EMA is approving it versus, you know, uh, FDA. A lot of times, it doesn't really have an impact because FDA can't approve a drug unless the application comes in. And so sometimes companies, sponsors, will submit applications over in the EMA or Japan and they'll approve a drug and we don't approve it. And people will say, well, why aren't you approving it? It looks great over there. And it's because we didn't get an application. Mm. For whatever reason, the, the sponsor chose not to, to apply here in the United States. So, um, and that's something that a lot of people don't know about. We have to have an application. We can't just look at a drug study and say, oh, that looks good. We're going to go ahead and approve it. Let's see. Um, how, how different should the approval process be for um, rare disease drugs, orphan drugs, um, versus kind of blockbuster or mass use drugs? The rare drugs, what, what happens is you when you have a disease where it's rare, you have fewer people that can get into the clinical trials. And so um, I'm not an expert in the rare disease area, but we do have a department, uh, an office of rare diseases. We have an office of orphan drug products. 
and what FDA does is um, tries to provide some financial benefits to sponsors because a lot of times sponsors, they need that incentive to make the drug because they know they're not going to make very much money from the drug because there are fewer people who get that disease. So FDA tries to provide that, that kind of incentive um, as well as there are other ways in the trial design that are that have taken place, whether they accept fewer people or they make other exceptions. Um, FDA is very sensitive to these groups and is very um, tries to work with them as closely as possible to, to get these because that's definitely an unmet need mm -hmm. for a lot of these diseases. Mm -hmm. Why are there so many different agencies and departments within the FDA? Well, there's, oh, I see, within the FDA. Oh, sure. yes. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I misread that first. Um, well, because each office is so different. It's, for example, with the Center for Biologics, biologics are very unique. You need to have experts who are reviewing the um, applications who are experts in biologics and the same with devices, et cetera. Then you need all these support agencies as I, uh, or offices, they're not really agencies. As I put a slide up before and talked about the other offices, like you have an office of compliance and what compliance does is it keeps track of clinical trials and makes sure that the investigators are being compliant with the regulations, the statutory laws that say how the, the, in the trial should be held. Um, medical Office of Medical Policy. Uh, again, they, all these offices support the three major centers of cedar seber and CDRH. Office of Minority Health, of course, is to make sure, you know, when sponsors are coming in to talk about clinical trials, and recruitment that they think about these minority groups and make sure, yeah, that they are identified. Mm -hmm. Same thing with women's health and pediatric therapeutics. You know, that office is very needed because in the past we were afraid to do clinical trials on children and we're now realizing we have to do clinical trials on children. Children are not just small adults. They really do, um, uh, metabolize drugs differently, and they have a different impact on kids. So as I said, there are a lot of different offices, and they're all there, not totally maybe, but most of them are there to support the, the three centers, to help them do their job. And just to add to that, um, although they are separate centers, and it looks very, like we're divided, we work well together um, on various issues. There are a lot of cross-cutting issues that come up, and I think one of the things that I mentioned is the Fidesia 1137, which is how to involve the patient earlier on in the process. And we have every one of these centers really thinking about how ways to do this. Um, once we get the formalized and organized the comments that we've received, we will issue them to the centers and really think about how the best, you know, what the best next steps are. So, you know, there are situa office situations as we go to a meeting, there's representation across the board. So it's not like we sit in our silo, um, but there, do, there does need to be structure, and I think that was the, the point. And, we, and there are often products that come in for review that are combination products, and mm -hmm. that's when the two, two or maybe even three uh, centers work together. Um, uh, Big in oncology, I'm sorry, I specialize in oncology, which is why I keep bringing oncology up, is the idea of these companion diagnostics with the treatments being approved together with all of the work that's being done in the genetic field of, can, of uh, cancer and finding mutations and, and treating them accordingly. And so they all appear separate, but I can't tell you how many meetings occur every day where someone from almost all the different offices are in the same room working together. It's just they have expertise in other er in different areas. 
Last question. Uh, we have a, our patient advocates are going to be um, in Washington, D.C. this September for the MDF conference. And so somebody asked, is the FDA open to the public? Can my family visit when we are in D.C. later this year? Um, the, the advocates, we often have the advocate groups come in and we set up a meeting. Uh, OCA sets up the meeting. We try to invite people from the different offices who would be interested or who have products uh, that are of interest to the advocacy group or whatever. Um, I you know we were sitting here discussing this before we started. I don't, we, we do make special arrangements for advocacy groups and different groups to come in. I've never really seen a family come in. We're offices here and there's really not a whole lot to look at. Um, we, and then we also, there's a lot of security because as you can imagine, this campus is filled with proprietary sensitive information. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So well, we would be glad to, to, to sponsor you guys to come on in. It would be great. Well, great. Well, thank you, ladies, so much. Um, I'm sure, you know, on behalf of everybody, thank you, Selena and Deb, for for taking your time and teaching us about the FDA. This has been really helpful and um, really important to the myotonic dystrophy community as we kind of move forward with our first ever clinical trial. And it's just, it's really good to know about the whole regulatory process. This has been really helpful. So um, thank you both. And thank you, everybody, for participating in the webinar. Thanks, Sarah. Thank Thanks you. for the opportunity.